my good friend Josh. Uh, I met him through my church a um, long time ago when he was so young. He came to my church from India with his dad and then actually his mom and sister. And uh, he's a pastor now, assistant pastor at uh, what's, what's the church that you're pastoring? Kennel Park Baptist Church. Kennel the- Park Baptist Church. So, I mean, not to uh, lift him up too high because I know he's a humble guy, but great preacher, very solid in the word. And I'm sure we have our differences, but I'm glad to accept that because he's, he's a good, solid brother and he cares about um, delivering the word of God truthfully, as much of his ability, and serving him. So um, I wanted to talk about today because I saw that video of yours um, about the the differences or the topic of Christian liberty, right? Uh, which is the idea of having the freedom to do what we want to do in Christ, but not to the point where we're sinning, right? So how would you how would you go about explaining it, the difference between, oh, well, I can do whatever I want to do, as opposed to I do this so I can want others to to Christ without sacrificing in, in a sinful lifestyle. Sure. Well, it's a doctrine in scripture. And, um, it's it's founded in, in various passages. I, I think of uh, Galatians 5 when Paul instructs um, the churches of Galatia to stand fast in their liberty because the Judaizers were, uh, were attacking this doctrine um, by enforcing regulations and and rules upon the people. I think of passages like Romans 14, where Paul says, um, sometimes there, well, there's times in which we um, put down our liberty for the sake of spiritual maturity of other people, and we don't abuse it. Um, I think of Titus, um, in which, you know, uh, t- uh, Paul instructs um, Titus to not let, you know, the, the grace of God teaches us some things into denying godliness and or less. So I think the, uh, the idea of Christian liberty is not just um, in one place in the New Testament, but it's seen throughout. It's multifaceted. And so you have to have a, a biblical um, understanding of the doctrine to fully understand it. Um, by no means do I claim that I know everything about Christian liberty or how, the ins and outs of it. But I think I have a good understanding just based on the biblical text. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, it, there's dangers in Christian liberty because there's people that think Christian liberty means that God's given me grace and I'm freed from the laws. So, and that's true. And that means I can just do whatever I want and uh, I can say what I want, live however I want. And, and Paul warned that your liberty is not given so that you can, it's not a license to do whatever you want to do. He says, should, you know, should I remain in sin and let grace abound? He said, God forbid, you know, it's making only time in the Greek. It means no way, you know, it's just not, not at all. Um, and so that's the extreme of, of liberty in the sinful arena. There's another extreme of liberty in the area of legalism. And I, um, you know, definitely, I would definitely say that there were, times growing up where I thought this was what Christian liberty was, where, um, where, or, or, the, or I abused liberty, I should say, you know, um, in the sense that I didn't understand Christian liberty, so I thought it was rules and regulations that made me spiritual or loved in the eyes of God, and that's not what the Bible teaches at all. It's all grace. It's none of me. And so, um, so liberty definitely does give you a fuller understanding of the gospel, a full understanding of what you have in Christ, um, and there's a lot of a lot of discussions to be had um, on working that out, um, but you know the Bible has the answer, and so we can discuss from that point of view. So, what would you say though to those that would say, "Well, I grew up in a very strict church where they said you have to do this, you can't do that," and kind of taking Christian, taking legalism to an extreme. And then they say, well, I'm not that anymore, so therefore I can listen to the music that I want to listen to. I can do the things that I want to because I'm free in Christ. Yeah, um, you know, rules aren't bad um, in the sense of, you know, your parents have rules. um, We have rules growing up. And so not all rules are just inherently bad. And I think it's also a danger of, of misunderstanding liberty. But it's understanding Sorry, Josh. Um, it's right there, Mom. Go ahead. <laughs> All yeah, right. it, it's understanding. Um, let me back up here. Uh, you know, I said rules aren't bad. Parents have rules, um, and and children are supposed to obey the rules. But it's when rules are divorced from the relationship that 
rules become um, just rules. Um, let me illustrate it this way. If, if there's no relationship between a parent and a child and a child is just told to do something and the answer of why you're supposed to do something is just because I said so, um, it's going to cause that child to rebel. Even if he doesn't rebel in the home, when he gets out of the home, um, you know, he's going to do whatever he wants. And so I think that's the problem with churches, certain churches that say these are the rules, and if you obey these rules, you're close to God. That's not a good uh, a good pattern to set because all the rules are not bad in themselves. If you don't have the right motivation for why there are rules, um, you're probably going to have a lot of rebellious individuals. Um, and so that's not right. But in putting rules in their proper context, understanding that rules are not there to save us, they're not there to make us more um, – you know, to be to be more loved by God, but they're there to help us to um, to stay closer to the Lord. In, this, in that sense, I think those are good too. Um, so yeah, it's uh, maybe ask a more specific question. I think I can maybe talk about it a little bit more. A- ask that question. I think I missed something in your question. I, I think you covered it good enough. I mean, it, it's basically you're saying that. Um, Rules, I mean, rules can be good, but you just have to apply it the right way in the right context. I think we got that. But my next question would be, how would you, to, to a church that kind of has it out of place and turns it into uh, what you were saying, like you, you have to do it this way in order to be accepted by God and kind of taking that out of biblical context, how would you address the pastor of a church or a church or try to fix it to where they're understanding that in a biblical way? How would you approach the people of that church, the pastor, the elders, the church in general, in order to fix that situation in a godly way without being conceited or prideful? Sure. And I would say probably private conversations with you and the pastor. You know, and I think it would be you going to passages of scripture and sitting down with the pastor. And I would definitely have a spirit of of a servant and ask him, you know, um, why um, you have to understand something about pastoral authority. While it's not I don't believe that a, a pastor is a, some guru where his word is authoritative to the point where no one can question. him. I don't think that's right at all. Um, he's just like mm-hmm. us, you know. Um, but God did call that pastor to that church, and the people of that church did vote him in. So there is a certain level of le- leadership that's on his shoulders. And so I think anytime that we try to, um, when anytime we disagree with a pastor um, on something that he's teaching, I think the first point is a private conversation with him. And maybe sometimes, sometimes we just misunderstand. Uh, sometimes there is a legitimate concern, but I think that should be hashed out in private uh, first and foremost. There's no reason to go around and start teaching people. Something when the pastor is teaching something else that's just going to cause increased okay. discord and disunity in the body. It's not going to help anything. So I would say a private conversation with, with the pastor is the first thing. And sometimes, you know, there are churches that I know of that that don't understand the concept of liberty. And there are churches that I think that preach it rightly. And um, if if those conversations aren't going anywhere, I would think for the sake of my family to grow and be in a church where the word of God is preached rightly, I would probably just quietly leave. You know, I don't think it's always our place to fix everything in a local church. It's I think it's if if we're not being taught right, believe right, it's our responsibility to find a church that is teaching right and preaching right. So um, I would say that that is the better solution than to try to fix everything at church. You're never going to find a perfect church. I mean, we're striving to be as pure as we can be, but there's no perfect church out there. But we should strive to be pure in our doctrine and um, what we preach and teach. Um, that's what I would say to that. And and back to the question of liberty specifically. Yeah, there are churches that don't understand it. Um, there are churches that abuse it one way or the other. And uh, I think it's just important for us to have a biblical understanding of Christian liberty so that we can teach our families and know what is right. Mm-hmm. What is What would be an example of a Christian liberty that we have? Like, you know, you can't do that, but just don't do it in a simple way. You know, what are some of these that you can that people t- take and say, no, you can't do that at all? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's a nuanced argument because culture changes, things that we enjoy are change. Um, a lot of things change uh, over time. So, I, I, trying to think of a, a particular example i'm not thinking one right off the top of my head but i can take you to the contemporary examples of the early church in romans 14 where it was 
um, eating meat, right? The Church of Rome was a very uh, ethnically diverse church that had lots of Jews, but it had also lots of Gentiles. And the Gentiles coming from worshiping idols in their pagan temples were okay with eating meat that was offered to idols. And the Jews were appalled by that. Um, so that was a contemporary issue in their day. Um, the Jews respected holy days and particular days, and the Gentiles were appalled by that. And so Paul you know, goes in Romans chapter number 14, and he says, hey, both of you need to lay down your liberty, even though it's okay to eat idol, uh, idols. It's okay to eat meat because it's just meat. Um, you know, It's not a big deal, but if it offends your brother, lay that liberty down on that altar um, for the sake of their spiritual maturity. And so often Christian liberty comes from the, the, the idea of, Discussing Christian liberty comes from the viewpoint of what can I do, um, whereas when you look at Scripture, the idea of Christian liberty is more so geared towards what should I not do for the sake of another brother, you know? So it's not a license to do whatever you want to do. If you always look at it from that point, I think you're going to be definitely on the side of tending to abuse liberty. But if you look at Christian liberty as what can't I do as to not offend somebody, they may be a uh, uh, a newer believer or someone that is weak in their faith, I think we would have a much better understanding of Christian liberty. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And here's here's one. I'll bring up like kind of like a contemporary topic, and maybe I phased out and I didn't hear this, but maybe maybe brought it up and I didn't hear it. But what do you say to those that say, um, I want to get a tattoo? So and actually, I do have one, <laughs> but so I can uh, attract, you know kind of attract that certain group and be like, hey, look, I got one too, but it'll be like a, kind of like a springboard into the gospel. Like, for example, you say, you know, it says Jesus, or it says Romans 1, 16, and you can even say, well, hey, you know what, this is the Bible verse, let me talk to you about what that is. Excuse me. Sure. One uh, second. One second, Josh. Okay. Are you right now? Uh, password for the ID. iPad, for the iPad. Oh. No. Yeah. You sure? Yes. Because I did, I did not work. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it should work. Okay. This is why I need to get my own place. <laughs> rephrase the question. Are you, rephrase the question again so I can uh, I can answer it. So, all right. What would you say to those that say, like, for example, I think this is a liberty issue as long as it doesn't offend a brother and you're careful, maybe cover it up. But I want to get a tattoo so I can reach out to that world and, you know, for example, maybe you want to get a verse written on your arm and, and that can lead into a conversation about the gospel. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it has to do with uh, a couple of things I would say to that. I think a lot of people that grow up in uh, conservative circles, um, a lot of these things that we'll talk about as contemporary issues um, would wound their conscience. They wouldn't have faith that what they're doing is right. And the Bible says in Romans 14, whatsoever is not a faith is of sin. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not having full faith that what you're doing is something that's biblical or something that's right or something that's able to be done, you shouldn't do it, right? That's the, the first mm -hmm. and principle, whatsoever is not a faith of sin. Um, talking about auxiliary issues, not necessarily what God specifically says you can do or cannot do, right? I mean, you know, adultery is sin. You're not, you, you don't have to have a, yeah. So there are some issues like what you said, whether it's music, um, whether it's that, you know, that idea of tattoos or, you know, it's, those are hotly debated. Um, so that's the first principle. So if your, your faith is, you know, if your conscience is wounded, don't do it. You know, it's wrong. It's sin for you to do that if that's the case. The secondary principle is, yeah, does it does it offend people? Does it offend believers? And there, I would say, a great swath of a Christianity, at least conservative Christianity, and you know, I would say that's the camp that I guess I'm, I'm in right now. Um, that would be considered offensive or something that just uh, is not a tool um, that is seen as something that um, you know. So, so I would say in that camp, you know, it's not, it doesn't help me at all, and I think it would do more hurt than good. So I wouldn't get it. If you're in a different place of the world or or a different place in the country where it's widely accepted and believers aren't offended by it i think that would be uh, maybe an issue of christian liberty um, but there's other principles that govern that so that's where soul liberty is so important you know you have to be right before god i can't tell you um, on the auxiliary issues whether you're right or wrong um, but you have to apply biblical principle and determine that um for, you bring uh, up an interesting word auxiliary issue i i know what you're trying to get out of that but to those who don't what how would you define define that word auxiliary issue 
I would say anything outside of the scope of what the Bible directly addresses. Um, there's a lot of things the Bible directly addresses. Um, there's a lot of principles um, that are addressed. But some of these more contemporary issues, you know, you can't go to a chapter and verse to find it. Um, you know, and there's a lot of things that, let's just say, um, uh, let's say, let's talk about uh, drinking, you know, alcohol. Good, uh, I can go to a number of passages that speak very negatively about the use of alcohol. Um, I, I personally can't take you to a, a place where it says that any type of fermentation that you put in your body is sin. I can't take you to a place like that, you know, because uh, that no, no such passage exists. But I can take you a number of places that show the dangers and um, the sin of drunkenness, um, place where it's contrasted being filled with the spirit. Um, take you a number of those places. And so that's one of the, that, the issue of, of, of drinking is, is probably closer to being a biblical issue than an auxiliary issue, because I think the Bible does speak to it. Um, so that's what I mean by auxiliary issue, something that the Bible doesn't necessarily speak directly to. What, why do you say that I was just say drinking is an auxiliary issue? Because I personally think it is. Because like you did say that you just don't want to get drunk. And what if somebody that's they're arguing, you don't want to get drunk. And also it does say, you know, like Paul said, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding. So it's, it can't be wrong because it was fermented wine. And all those others that would argue, no, it wasn't. But if it was, and I think it was, what would you say to that argument? Yeah, no doubt there was a level of fermentation to uh, the wine in the Bible. I know that there are some people, and then growing up, I kind of heard that here and there that 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 wine that Jesus drank wasn't fermented. I mean, that's just not true because right. it's true. We understand that there was a level of fermentation, but you do have to also understand that strong drink mentioned in the Bible is the equivalent of beer and wine today. It wasn't the wine that that Christ drank. It was, I think, it was one to thirty-two parts of uh, i think that was the ratio of the fermentation of that day and they did it because they didn't have fridges and um and so they didn't have modern medicine as well when paul told timothy to drink a little wine it was a very medicinal use that he was talking about not a a, a social use right so that is a different context no. so it's, it's it's really dangerous when we exegete to the place where we take a specific context and apply it to a different issue and i think that's what's done in the case of Paul and Timothy, when he says take a little wine, it, you know, he didn't say, hey, drink a little wine to have fun or to enjoy right. it. He was definitely talking about a medicinal purpose, right? And so Paul knew an underlying condition that Timothy had. In the case of Jesus, it was something that was a common practice done for um, cleansing. It wasn't necessarily, it wasn't appalled when a drunk, when someone got drank too much. You know, it was, it was a, uh, I forget the the French word that people use, um, where it's something that's looked down upon in, in, in a culture when someone. I'll excuse your French. Faux pas. There we go. Faux, it was a faux, it was a cultural faux pas if someone got drunk on the wine that Jesus was was making. So, yeah, it's a nuanced argument. Um, once again, I can't take you to a specific place where the Bible st specifically says drinking is sin, but because right. there's a myriad of 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 principles that condemn um, drunkenness, and because in that culture in which the Bible was written, it was something that was widely used because there was not an alternative. I would say to the person today that picks up a a bottle of beer or drinks wine that is not the same substance that jesus drank you know it's far more potent than what jesus drank and leading go ahead wasn't there, wasn't there bible verses that even say that strong drink is okay in certain contexts or maybe you just don't know of that verse because i think i have seen or heard that at least yeah, I mean, I don't know of any place in the New Testament for sure that says that. I think in the New Testament specifically, you know, yeah, I think it's mentioned. Um, yeah, and, and once again, I, I am agreeing with you that this is like this is an issue where I, I think it would be an object of Christian liberty. But I think the evidence from the biblical standpoint and the standpoint of it offending other believers is so heavy, at least in the in the circle of Christianity that I'm in, that I would refrain from that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I am too, and that's why, like, when I'm throwing up tattoos and drinking, those are the two things that I kind of, you know, like, have in my mind, go, okay, I gotta be careful, you know, and blah, 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 and, and have these, like, you know, so what I'm saying is, like, for example, with a tattoo, I cover it up pretty much all the time, unless, one, I'm at the gym, or two, I'm purposely showing somebody that I know they won't get offended at tattoos, for the sake of bringing up a topic of the gospel so I can witness to them. Or, you know, also just for myself, it's something that maybe when I get married, my wife doesn't have the problem, you know, 
we can enjoy each other's <laughs> full bodies without getting too detailed. But you know, but you know, like it just says amen. I mean, that's something simple. But I I usually don't show it just to anybody, and so that's that's one aspect of not causing my brother to fall. And another thing is what. The drinking, for me, it's more like a social thing. Like, for example, I went to a cocktail party for my boss. That's pretty much all, all the kind of drink that was around. There wasn't really juice or anything like that. It was all alcohol. So it's like, okay, I'm, I'm having a margarita, but I'm not going to drink the whole thing because I don't want to see my, you know, see my conscious or go to the fact that I'm going to get drunk. So you want to be very careful. So I, you know, so but yeah, I can understand since I grew up in the same kind of circles that you are in right now. I understand, and I think that God has allowed that to, to shape my cautionary disposition of I want to make sure that I'm not causing another brother or sister to stumble in the faith. Sure. Yep. And that's the principle of Christian liberty for sure. And, uh, you know, everybody draws their line differently. Um, everybody puts, you know, the line in the sand in different places. Um, and, you know, the principle in Romans 14 is really awesome because— before Paul even gets to the idea of Christian liberty, he talks about several things that must be true um, in order to even get to that principle. In verses 7 and 8, I believe in Romans 14, he basically says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live in the Lord, and whether we die, we die in the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are Lord's. And so the principle there is we have to stop living for self. And it takes— um, an individual who understands Christian liberty to say, it's not what I can do, what it's I can what do. I won't do. It's, it's so that I stop living for myself. If your motivation to get a tattoo or to drink is, hey, what can I do to push those boundaries? I think that's wrong because Paul said, if it was up to me, I wouldn't eat meat for the rest of my life if it meant that I wouldn't offend a brother. So yeah. I take that to the other extreme and saying, listen, Christian liberty enables me to do this, but Christian liberty also enables me because I am loved and accepted by God because of because of my standing in Christ that I'm going to go to whatever extreme that I need to to make sure there is a bridge for the gospel. And so you know, that, then he goes on to say that the gospel is a focus of verse number nine, I believe, in Romans 14. Then he Then he goes on to say that hey, everything will be taken care of at the judgment seat of Christ in the next following verses. And sometimes we, we argue with our brother and we, we set a nod against thy brother, I think is the, is the phrase that Paul uses. And then he says, hey, listen, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So these auxiliary, quote-unquote, issues, hey, listen, there's bigger fish to fry in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. If your brother's wrong, if he's in, in error in this, God will take care of at the judgment seat of Christ. But then he gets the point of Christian liberty. Just stop causing other people to stumble. Mm -hmm. um, stop putting an occasion of stumbling before them. Nothing is unclean of itself. He's already mentioned that. You already know that. Um, but if it grieves a brother, if it hurts a brother, don't do it. And he goes on, you know, later on to say, if it means that I'll never meet again for the rest of my life, that means I won't meet again for the rest of my life. And so once again, the Christian liberty is not what can I do. It's what can't I do to further God's glory in the gospel. And, and, so and that's the Christian liberty. Be, how far can I get to the line of crossing? It should be how far can I stay away from the line so I don't fall over? Yeah, and not just fall over, so that I can I can I can position myself to be a clean vessel to be sharing the light of the gospel. Right, we're supposed to live gospel focused, and if that's true, that means we are going to do whatever is possible to be usable as vessels for God. That means not tiptoeing the line of so-called liberty that we have, but staying as far away from it to help. Others, not living underneath rules and regulations because we can get favor in God. That's an abuse of liberty. That's the legalism that we grew up in. But it's the idea, I'm going to stay far away from the line because I have the liberty to do so to help people with the gospel. And that that's great freedom. That's great freedom and liberty when you understand that. And so really today, I live underneath – I don't want to use the word more rules, but I live, if I could say it this way, a stricter lifestyle – than I did when I was in a maybe even a legalistic system growing up, because the motivation is completely different now. Right, uh, you get it? So, so yeah, even my legalistic, I was doing it because I thought it was required. I was doing it because I thought okay. it was necessary. Right. And when you realize the idea of liberty, you realize, man, my liberty enables me to do it, but that liberty also gives me the motivation to not do anything that would get in the way of preaching the gospel. And there's great freedom. That's a good that's point. Liberty. 
Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of these talks about Christian liberty is always directed towards, and I'm not accusing you, it's mm-hmm. just always directed towards, hey, what can I do? And that's not the way that liberty is presented in Scripture at all. It's the opposite. Mm-hmm. What can't uh, I do? It's definitely, it's definitely a, a good thinker because, you know, I think I've been guilty of maybe not necessarily this or the drinking, but just in general. Saying, you know, like, for example, I, and this is a good example of how I came out of something, but came back to it because I've realized the right freedom that I have to, you know, what you were saying is with music. And it's like, okay, well, you know, we don't have, we can't, it's not that we can't listen to this type of music because we want to gain favor with God, but at the same time, we shouldn't listen to that favorite music because we have the liberty not to do and that, you know, you explained that. And uh, so, you know, it's been a long, for a while, I kind of went back to it. It's like, okay, well, there's nothing necessarily bad about this. I don't hear anything bad in the lyrics. And then that, that, there was a slippery slope because it took me, I don't know, okay, let's go a little bit down more, you know, it's like, okay, not, not a big deal. So finally God brought me out of that to go, no, because that's going to just cause you to, not, you know, not necessarily, oh, well, you won't be in a strong relationship with me, but that's going to just cause you to, to backslide even more and more and bring you to a point of despairment where yeah. you have freedom in Christ when you stay away from those kinds of things. For sure. For sure, man. And, uh, and that's a true understanding of, of liberty, for sure. Um, there's a lot of things that I can do, but I just don't do them because I know that um, it, it won't help me at all. You know, it's like the idea of, um, well, you know, let me just mention a verse and maybe I can wrap it up with that. You know, Titus 2, 11 and 12, um, the grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. You know, grace teaches us. Grace doesn't just save us, it sanctifies us. And that sanctification that grace does, it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Um, I could parse those words, I could actually use those words, but at the end of the day, there are behaviors and activities that are more in line with what is worldliness than what is spiritual. Um, and grace is a constant um, sanctifying agent in our lives that teaches us that the more holy you live does not mean that you're going to be less able to reach a lost world, right? It actually means that you'll have a better footing to reach the world because they'll see the true difference. And that, should, yeah. that shouldn't be as a result of legalism. It's not do all these rules just because to do all those rules. But as you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ, as you learn more about his word and about how he wants you to be holy, how God is ultimately holy. He's separate, right? That's what the word means. Right. Um, separated from the world and the world system. The more apart we come, it's not like, oh, because you became more holy or you put away some behaviors or some things that are that feed your flesh – that you're not going to be able to reach that world. That's not how it works. <laughs> you know, the light shines brighter in darkness, not because that light is dimmer. You know, let me say that again. Yeah, the darker yeah. the night, the brighter the light, right? And that principle is seen throughout Scripture. And um, and so, you know, just because we want to bridge the gap, um, we use that phrase a lot, or we want to do some things that the world is doing to be like the world. I don't see that principle a whole lot in Scripture. Now, we can maybe finagle some principles to get that out especially when Paul that you can kind of, um, the only thing that you can kind of try to contort uh, I mean not contort you know and kind of like mangle in order to fit your view is uh, what was I going to say well, there's being a in the world of- but be not of the world and yeah. it's the same I'm in the world but I'm not of it and that's just a false understanding of scripture Right, and that's not what that passage is saying. But I think there's another passage when Paul says, um, you know, I'm all things to all men. When he talks about that illustration of running the race, and he yeah. was saying the Jews, I'm the Jew, the Gentile, I'm the Gentile. And sometimes he will use that passage to talk about how, um, you know, we should listen to the world's music, do what the world is doing, go to the world's parties in order to be to reach the world. And you'll often find that it's not. That the world we're reaching, it's the world that's actually reaching us, and we're becoming more and more like the world. I'm losing it. So you never go wrong living a holy and right life. Now, if you're living a holy and right life and obeying rules because you think you can get fair with God, that's legalism, right? That's not right. Um, that's the difference. But if you're living a holy, righteous, sober, righteous, godly life in this present world, as Titus examines, because grace teaches us to do that, 
then you have the right motivation. Then you can actually truly be a light. You know, it's the mm-hmm. illustration of a bad apple and a basket of good apples. The bad apple makes the other apples bad, not the other way around. You know, the good apples don't make that bad apple good. And so that principle is true. When Paul was talking about I'm to the Jews, a Jew, I'm to the Gentiles, a Gentile, he wasn't talking about behaviors. He was talking about the customs of the day. He was talking about I'm not going to do something that offends them, right? So it was it was, it was was that sense, not necessarily I'm going to do whatever the Jews are doing that are sinful or can be contrived as worldly. It was I'm not going to do it. It's the whole idea of liberty. You know, I'm not going to offend them. Um, so I, I have two questions that stem out of there. First of all, how would you define worldliness as opposed to sinfulness, or are they similar in some sense? Yeah, I think there's um, worldliness. In my personal preaching, the way that I describe it, I would probably make them more synonymous than different. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know. I guess I'd have to look at that, look up those words and examine it in comparison to sin. And as, you know, sin is missing the mark. At least Hamardia is, um, and that's the, the the Greek word for sin. Um, worldliness, I'm sure, is a different original root word, um, but I think they have a lot of similarities in, in the practical application of them. Um, right. Worldliness in the sense of, of of the world system, and the you know the author of the world system is Satan, and he's you know um, he's obviously going to promote sin. So that's kind of I think it would be more closely synonymous. I'm sure there's nuanced differences there. Yeah, but. I think the nuances are, for example, you know, the illustration of Hudson Taylor going to China, and then the Christians not being able to reach that world until Hudson Taylor grew a ponytail. Right. And that would be kind of contrasting a little bit between worldly customs and sure. molding to that Definitely. as opposed to something simple. Definitely, yeah. There's definitely there definitely customs and such. You know, in India, in the southern part of India where I'm from, the men wear um, basically skirts. You know, and if I wore a skirt around here, I'd probably be called a lot of um, a lot of church. <laughs> I probably wouldn't be the best thing to do. You know, yeah. but to me, I have no problem conforming to that kind of custom because it's you know it's not associated with cross dressing or you know abusing biblical manhood in that mm-hmm. custom particular custom so you know you have to have a working understanding of customs and cultures and you know what is worldly in the sense associated with sinfulness and wrong and what is just customs of a particular region or area yeah sure so one more thing that i wanted to bring up well actually one thing i want to have ask and then one thing i want you to do um when you bring up clean vessel do you think that that word is synonymous with blamelessness? And if it is, can you define that? Yeah. Um, clean vessel. I'm trying to think of the passage of Scripture. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's on the edge of my brain. Um, I think it's in the book of First Corinthians. I'm not remembering it right now. Could you maybe like the gist of the verse or the topic that it's bringing up? Yeah, I use that phrase a lot. You know, you're to be a clean vessel or an earthen vessel, you know, a vessel meet for the master's use. You know, that's a phrase that we use. Right. In the sense that we're just living a a a sinless life. Now, we cannot be sinless in the sense that we can't be absent from sin. One day. Um, But first, John, you know. Uh, explains that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we can't be walking with the Lord and right with the Lord in a relationship with God if it's if it's consistent and real and, and genuine and we're confessing sin as the Holy Spirit of God brings it up in our hearts, where that's what I would define as being a clean vessel ready to be used. You know, we have a, a constant walk and talk with God. And do you think that that would be the same thing as the word blameless, or do you think there's a difference that being used? Well, the word blameless is used, you know, the qualification of a, of a pastor. The root word comes from the idea of not having handle, something you can hold on to. Um, in other words, if we're confronted with sin or something wrong, we're going to be quick to confess it, acknowledging our sin, not hiding it. You know, so that's the idea of blameless. That it's not, not, not that we're sinless, but that we're transparent about our sin and who we are. And we're, to the best of our abilities, but through the grace of God, we're living right with him. You know, that's the idea of blameless. So, yeah, I would say there's a lot of sin. Um, synonymous elements between living a clean life and being blameless. Very good. All right, man. Well, the last thing I want you to do is can you share the gospel but in light of what we just talked about? Mm. Well, the gospel never changes, but I guess there's different ways to present it for sure. Yeah. Um, 
but the gospel in a nutshell, as Paul said in the book of um, at the end of his book to the Corinthians, <clears throat> he said it's a death by our resurrection of Christ and placing faith in Him as Savior. Um, you know, acknowledging our sin and putting our faith and trust in Him. Um, so, in light of 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 what we talked about, liberty, I'll go back to my illustration of Galatians five in which the Judaizers were telling the, the, the Christians that you have to follow the Old Testament on top of accepting the gospel. And Paul was showing that's an abuse of liberty. Um, you don't have to keep the law in order to be saved. You don't have to keep the law in order to get favor with God. Um, Christ spanned that gap. You can never do enough. Christ has already done what is required, and that's to be the sacrifice. And so putting our faith and uh, trust wholly on his, in the finished work of Christ on Calvary is what saves the sinner. It's what gives us new life. It is what um, places us in heaven, but it's so much more than that. You know, growing up, I always thought it's just a get out of uh, hell card, free card. Um, but salvation is so much more than that. And we're in the process of learning more and more about the gospel every day. The gospel doesn't just save us, but it is something that we are learning more and more about every day and all the efficacy that it has in our life. Um, what, do you, what do you say that, uh, what was I going to add? What, what if somebody said, okay, well, you know, I don't see myself as a sinner. What would you say to them? Well, if you don't see yourself as a sinner, you don't need a savior, right? And so if you if you don't realize the problem, you won't realize the need for a solution. And so, you know, no one can be saved until they first come to that realization. Um, and that's something that God's work, that's something that God's spirit has to do. I can't save anybody. I can't show somebody um, in the heart that they're a sinner, I can show them passages in Scripture. Clearly, you know, the Bible says in Romans 3, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Ecclesiastes says there's not a just man upon the earth that that, that sinneth not and doeth good. Um, so the Bible is very clear that we're, we're, we're sinners. Even general revelation creation, Romans 1 and Psalm 19, I'm uh, preparing to preach on that on Sunday. Even general revelation, the creation condemns us as sinners. But general revelation is not enough to save us. We need specific revelation. We need the Word of God to do that. Do you so, agree with Charles Spurgeon that we should be using the law of the commandments to show and demonstrate sin? Sure. Or That's just a great leave it to the Holy Spirit. In the book, uh, Galatians again, you know, the law was given as a schoolmaster to point us that we can't keep the law to show us that we are sinners. So yeah, that's a great way to. It's a great way to do it. Um, yeah. You know, showing specific verses that we are sinners sometimes is good enough for people because they already know that they're bad people. You know, they lie, they sin. People can realize that on their own. Um, but the law is a great tool, and that's the purpose of it, to show us that we are sinners as well. So, yeah, I would agree with that. No, I, I agree that most people know they're wrong, or they're wrong, they're sinners. But they, the Bible also says that most men will declare their own goodness so they might say oh yeah i'm a good person i'm i sin but i'm still a good person what would you say to that to try to urge them to see differently yeah there's none that do with good <laughs> yeah you know, the good that we do are as filthy rags um that's what isaiah says um so sometimes people people misconstrue that verse as saying that my um, unrighteousness is as filthy rags, but that verse says your righteousness is as filthy rags, that until the relationship with, with God through Christ is established, all the good things that we do are worthless in the eyes of God. Um, so, yeah, we are depraved in that sense, and that there is no way that we can do good apart from the finished work of Christ. And so, yeah, we do have to show people that even they might think they are a good person, no person exists in, uh, in the eyes of God because we're sinners. If you uh, are guilty of one point in the law, James says, you're guilty of it all. And so I would go to the passages and, and show them that, you know, there's no such thing as you being a quote-unquote good person, um, but that we're, we're equally depraved in the eyes of God and we need, we need salvation through Christ. Yeah. Very he makes us death to, he brings us from death to life. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, this has been fun. Um, I enjoyed it. I made me think and, you know, kind of uh, definitely have reconsidered some things on how I approach uh, sure. reaching out and stuff like that. So I thank you for your time and your friendship, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Sounds good, Jay. I'm glad I could do this today. All right. Definitely. All right, bye.